Hello and welcome to my review of Space 1999 Moon Odyssey by John Rankin. Space 1999 was Britain's answer to Star Trek and the TV series starring Martin Landau lasted 48 episodes across two seasons and four years. Rankin wrote five of the first ten tie-in novels including this one which was the second in the series begins with a brief recap of the main events of the series so far, namely that there was a base built on the moon and that its nuclear waste exploded and pushed the moon out of orbit and into space. Adventures followed among the stars detailed in episodes that were rarely very exciting, but in a period short of science fiction on TV were welcome nonetheless, especially with Landau's stately and watchable presence at the helm. While Moon Odyssey is not the name of one of the episodes, this book is just a retelling of material that was part of the series. In fact, it runs to just 143 pages, but still manages to include the episodes Alpha Child, The Last Sunset, Voyager's Return and Another Time, Another Place. As these are episodes 7, 17, 6 and 16 of the series, it makes for a curious set of decisions as the show was intended to be shown in a specific order, though most TV stations seem to have gone their own way with that as well. Alpha's Child, which is not called that in Rankin's novel, makes up the first two chapters. The first child is born on the breakaway moon to Cynthia Crawford and Jack, though the latter is already dead. The birth of the first moon child is a real morale boost for the crew, but it doesn't last long as the child rapidly ages. He then attempts to take control of the station. The child, now a man calling himself Jarek, says that he is an alien and that he's taken control of the child and that his species will soon arrive and take over the rest of the human population. However, aliens then attack the station and spaceships. They are Jarek's enemies and he begs the Alphans for help. There's little they can do and the writers have written themselves into an unwinnable situation. Then things are inexplicably reset. The crew that died in the attack are alive again, the baby is a baby again, and Commander Koenig observes, somehow they made it good. They must have given themselves up to save the whole community, which is genuinely wretched. A cop-out so awful, Kevin Smith might have directed it. The rest of the episode is okay though, with perhaps some mild criticism being that the aliens are so overpowering that the Alphans look passive and weak, especially Koenig. However, the theme that things out in space would be inexplicable and that the aliens' technology would be vastly superior was a conscious decision that the series producers wanted to explore, so it is slightly more forgivable. The story jerks via a line of dialogue to the next episode where the crew capture an alien probe that sets about terraforming the moon. Everybody is happy about this until one of their shuttles crash. The lost crew are led by Paul Morrow who eats some fungus that interferes with his mind and he attempts to take over the base shouting rhetoric along the lines of we have laid the foundation stone of mankind's future. The struggle be long and hard, faint hearts will not survive, which is at odds with how he came to get the fungus, claiming it had fallen from the sky just as he had given up hope. This episode feels like it's borrowing from the final act of Heinlein's Methuselah's Children, but it's a bit of a muddle, and Morrow's megalomaniac parroting of vaguely Heinleinian ideas is quite horrible. Chapter 5 begins with Voyager's Return. This one predates Star Trek, the motion picture, by about four years, but it has a similar idea at its core. The moon base encounters the Voyager probe, but its queller drive is spewing out neutrons, which cause an Eagle shuttle to crash and threaten to destroy the base. Koenig is torn, knowing that the probe will have an incredible store of knowledge about what is ahead of them and the human race. To destroy the probe would cause that knowledge to be lost forever. Luckily, or perhaps not, on board the Alpha is Ernst Linden, the man who designed the engine. He believes he can shut the engine down and retrieve the probe. However, his assistant lost his family when the original probe launched, and he harbours a grudge. Though he attacks and badly hurts Linden, the scientist is still able to successfully capture the probe. Unfortunately, the probe has passed through a local system and the engine has caused all sorts of damage, so the inhabitants turn up intent on repaying the probe's makers by slaughtering every last one of them. Though Lyndon offers himself as personally responsible, the aliens stick to their guns until Lyndon pilots the probes into their midst and explodes it, killing himself and the aliens. This is by far the best episode contained in the novel, is thoughtful and until the explosive ending exactly the sort of thing that Star Trek did really well. It's a fairly exciting story, but it deals with issues of morality. 
Of course, the final annihilation of the alien force would not settle the issue in any way and is of a highly dubious morality itself, but in about 50 pages it's hard to see how much more it might have been improved beyond the sort of diplomatic solution that Kirk or Picard would have found. It's also noticeable that it's the best story here, but it's also the longest story here. The shortest is the last episode in which a wormhole sends the moon base back to Earth. Unfortunately, the Earth has been wiped out in a disaster, possibly the loss of its moon or by gaining a new one or even two, because as they achieve their orbit, the Alphans discover there's another moon already there. They discover this other moon is them from the future. Unfortunately, the two moons are on a collision course and with the planet already occupied and unable to support more life, Koenig and crew return to their base and await the impact with the other, hoping for more of those sciencey quirks to resolve their fate. It is the second of four stories in which they are very passive and inactive in the face of a dilemma or threat. The two moons, though, connect and all is well, with the moon base returned back to its original trajectory out into the unknown just in time for book three. Given that the episodes were in the 45-minute region, Rankin obviously has little room for flowery prose. This example is the closest he gets. The moon was accelerating, hurtling itself forward into the unknown forces ahead. The outriders were already on them. Direct vision ports were suddenly flushed with colour as tiny particles of exploding gas lashed them in polychrome rain. The whole fabric of main mission was creaking and groaning with the stress, like the timbers of a wooden ship in a hurricane wind. But coming at the finale as the two moons are about to crash against each other is probably a decent time, place and scene worth saving your best for. The simile is strong, but this reads like an author making the most of editorial confines where the rest of the book is largely perfunctory. I doubt there are a lot of passages in the book that aren't broadly similar to the way they were written in the teleplays. Conversely, while the whole project is flawed and rushes through the one opportunity to re explore these themes and characters without constraint, I did think that generally the relationship between the two leads was a little stronger thanks to Rankin occasionally straying into their minds and thought processes. It actually feels like these two are in love, which didn't come across in the series particularly well, if I recall correctly. The rest of the cast are largely unnecessary in the absence of any sort of detail. Morrow and Carter are so interchangeable, I struggle to remember what function either performed, while the rest, especially Kano, the computer guy, are defined solely by their role to the point of cardboard cutout. Kano so much so that, with the memories of the show sketchy at best, I was initially unsure if Kano was the name of the computer or a person whose sole job was to read the computer's output aloud. Strangely, what would have been guest appearances on the show are more developed, with Quella, Linden giving personality and motivation which makes at least a two-dimensional relationship with assistant Haynes. Both characters appear in just the one episode, though. Regina Kesslin, the female guest appearing in the last episode, gets slightly different treatment. She screams a lot and is objectified by Rankin in a way that is out of place amongst the text this sparse and hurried, even during something simple like this description. Hands rigid to her trim thighs is not just unnecessary, but positioned in a scene that is otherwise intended to be exciting or dramatic, so it's out of place as well. That Rankin does something similar to Regina perhaps three times across the 30 pages or so she appears and doesn't do it to anyone else, it all adds up to the feeling that it is a bit gratuitous. Overall, Space 1999, a moon odyssey, blasts through nearly two hours of TV in less than 150 pages. Sadly, even this doesn't make it a very exciting read due to an author content to just go through the motions and the weaknesses of the original source material. When it was on TV, Space 1999 walked a lot of the same paths as Star Trek, but critics at the time had some choice words to say about the quality of its writing and naturally they are present here too. The muddled message of Morrow on magic mushrooms wastes the opportunity to really explore a theme and instead seems more like parroting somebody else's ideas. The ending to the Jarek story is especially rushed and poor. The most Star Trek episode of them all, The Return of Voyager, is the highlight here, but even that can't resolve itself without morally grandstanding while slaughtering people. Overall, while the TV show is a decent enough product of its time, there isn't enough about this book that's different from that to make it worth recommending. Thanks for watching. Like and sub for more like this. My books, which are on sale in the month of March, and all of my social media are linked in the description. So check them out if you can.